Then you're on. All right. Good morning. <laughs> Welcome to North Carolina History Theater Podcast. And uh, I'm here, Bill Hand and Per Erickson, our co-host along with us, and uh, taking a look at things. We have a special guest. Before we get into that, let's talk about, very briefly, tell, me, tell us what's going on tonight, Per. Well, tonight uh, we're having uh, our first auditions, tonight and uh, this afternoon, uh, uh, auditions for Honor, uh, the musical which, uh, as we all know, uh, ran in uh, January 2020. It seems like uh, it seems like a decade ago. It that, does. Uh, that, that, that you get a, a good pandemic in there. It just yeah. screws everything up so yeah, bad. Yeah, yeah, threw us a real curveball. Yes. Uh, so um, tonight, uh, 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 this afternoon from three to five, and uh, tonight uh, from seven to nine, uh, we're going to have auditions at the Oranger Auditorium. Uh, on the campus of uh, Craven Community College. Um, we ask anyone that is interested in participating uh, in this, uh, in this uh, event uh, to uh, attend and, uh, if you so desire, mm-hmm. to audition. Uh, if you're uh, new to this, uh, we ask you that you memorize a one-minute monologue, uh, that you uh, be prepared to uh, do a little singing, a uh, short American folk song or uh, a song of your uh, of your choice, um, and uh, there will also be a, a cold reading from the uh, script of the uh, play. We're looking for adults of all ages, but we are specifically looking for uh, two young boys uh, to fill in parts uh, mm-hmm. of it because since the play was yeah, was, so was done, uh, the boys that we had have since grown. They, they've done that <laughs> weird thing that happened to the boys over yes. a year and a half, two years. Yes, 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 yes. yes. Um, One of the boys is, um, it was Richard Dobbs Bates' son, around, he would have been around three or four, but we're looking for around anywhere from about five to seven or eight years old, small mm-hmm. boy. Mm-hmm. And then John Rice Green, and he is a slave boy who is around eight or nine years old. Both have lines, uh, particularly John Rice Green does, and uh, are good and interesting parts. Yes. The performance dates uh, uh, are set at April 21st through uh, 24th. In other words, April of, uh, of next year, and then April 30th and May, mm-hmm. May 1st. Uh, we will also have editions this coming Saturday, November yes. 20th, from uh, 12 to 2. So uh, so you have no excuse. Come on. No out. excuse. And if you're only just now hearing about this, we'll even lift that one-minute monologue. We'll just yak at you and get you through <laughs> a minute of talking somehow or other. And uh, Yes. Any any folk song at all, and if it worse comes to worse, we'll consider Happy Birthday a folk song. Or if you, if you want to try Bohemian Rhapsody, uh, you can do that too. That would yes. be entertaining. Yeah, that would be I'd entertaining. I'd like to hear that. Yes. <laughs> I'm not sure if there's any way that it has been performed that I haven't seen it, right? You get down to including a video movie that was spoken all the dialogue and then cats doing it. It's a weird show. Anyway, yes. yes. Welcome to North Carolina History Theater uh, Podcast once again. And we have with, with us a guest. By the way, today we're doing, well, our first guest is Ken Hess. How are you doing, Ken? I'm doing pretty Welcome well. Welcome to the show. You. And uh, Ken does experimental theater, or experimental film, I should say. We're going to talk about that and give you a warning as well. If you're having a little weird problem saying, this doesn't sound right, um, we're also doing experimental broadcast today. The production room kind of shut down on us, so we're out here on spit and bailing wire production. Uh, working off of our, our microphone is a big iPad. And... Uh, our, our producer is in here with us, so we have to really behave and be good mm. and see how it all goes. So, tell us about a little bit about what you do here. Just this gives an introduction of what experimental film is. Well, experimental film is uh, basically uh, just about anything you want it to be. I mean, uh, you hand somebody a camera and you say, go make me a film. And they come back with whatever it is, and that can be an experimental film. Mm-hmm. You can um, uh, have no characters, you can have no dialogue, you can have no plot, you can have really no point at all to it. As you, you know, if you've looked at any experimental films, you know that's really mm-hmm. the case. And um, we had the Experimental Film Festival here on September 18th up at the Bank of the Arts. And I think people weren't really totally expecting what they saw in a lot of those films, but uh, 
anyway, next year I'm going to do things different. And, uh, you know, that's kind of the theme of the, the festival is do mm -hmm. something different. So it's going to be different next year. But experimental film in itself, there's really no rules. It can be just about anything you want it to be. So. Mm -hmm. Okay, now, the one film that has particularly fascinated me, and Terry watched it recently, and he was very fascinated himself. The one you told us about was the old, back in 1963 in the Moth Light. Moth Light. And uh, we were hoping to show that to you, but um, I guess I sent the wrong format to our producer, so there's more of our experimental broadcasting. Um, tell us a little bit about what that film is like as a, as a classic example. Okay. And here, I'll let you come in here because you had some more. You had deeper thoughts on it than I did. I'm looking uh, at it going, wow. <laughs> uh, and Pear was much deeper in his response. <laughs> well, sure, that's what experimental film does to you sometimes. Uh, Andy Warhol uh, filmed the Empire State Building for eight solid hours on 16 millimeter film and called it Empire. And it, you know, it starts in the daytime, goes to night. And it's even kind of out of focus, and that's his experimental film, and it's silent. And if, if you can sit through it, you can do anything. There was the other one called Sleep, too, where he, <laughs> Sleep. Where, where he just filmed somebody sleeping yeah. for eight hours. Yeah, <laughs> yeah he's, he, he did some really interesting ones. I, I found one yesterday that uh, I had never seen before. I, I can't say the name on, <laughs> on your show, but anyway, I'll tell you later, and you can look it up if you want. It's a family-friendly name. Well, right it's, it's not a dirty movie, <laughs> but the title is. I see. So well, I don't want to. Okay. Mm. But anyway, you can look up Andy Warhol films and find it for mm. yourself. <laughs> but yeah, Moth Light uh, was by Stan Brackage, and Stan Brackage is probably one of the most famous experimental filmmakers um, Maya Darren is another one. Um, you mm. know, there's a, a, a whole list of those folks who were part of that Bowery crew in New York in the early 60s. Uh, but Stan Brackage is kind of famous because uh, one of the first things he did was he wanted to go outside the boundaries of, of regular narrative filmmaking. And Moth Light is a great example of experimental because it's really weird. He took film that had been um, developed, and it was clear, of course, you could see right through it, you know, it wasn't black, because that would mean it was exposed, but he took unexposed film, developed it, and then glued moth parts to it, <laughs> and literally took moth pieces of the insects. A holocaust and, of bugs. <laughs> yeah, glued it to the film, and rolled it up and ran it through a projector. And now on YouTube, you can find it on YouTube, mm -hmm. but um, it doesn't have the same effect because what you're supposed to get is the clatter of the the gate, you know, opening and shutting, you know, that yes. sound. Mm -hmm. and it's supposed to be the moths flapping. So, um, and it's just... And also the flickering of the lights. Yeah, the flickering too, yeah. It's supposed to be like uh, moths making, you know, beating their wings. But... Um, you know, it's literally, that's all it is, is light being shined through uh, moth parts. Now, you're watching this, and you see all these bizarre little images of bits of bug. You wouldn't even necessarily know it was a bug if you didn't know the, the story behind it, just flashing by all over it. So, yeah. a black yeah. and white kaleidoscope. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I, I sort of took a, a perhaps a, a deeper dive than Bill did down this I won't say rabbit hole because it's it's just fascinating, you know, uh, finding out that you know one of the first experimental films was uh, uh, a film called Un Chat Andalou, Andalou, oh right, uh, by uh, Luis Buñuel and Salvador Dali in 1929. Yeah, <laughs> which is part of the surrealism and Dadaism uh, movement, and uh, then going on and, and uh, that amazing film by. Uh, uh, Maya Darren meshes uh, meshes of the afternoon, okay. and one of my favorite all time films, and, and of course it, it, it clicked in my head. Of course that's experimental. Was uh, Kiana Squatsi. That's the uh, Jeffrey uh, uh, Godfrey Reggio film with the Philip Glass score, uh, which uh, uh, came out. Uh, I believe it was in the eighties. Uh, it's just an uh, just an amazing. Uh, Amazing film, uh, uh, a lot of a lot of time lapse, uh, and basically uh, uh, showing what our world 
has become, juxtaposed to what the natural world is. You know, it's just a, just a, particularly with the Philip Glass uh, score. Right, I haven't seen so, that one, but that's oh, that's a, cool. that's a, yeah. Uh, so, uh, yeah. So, uh, w what you're saying then is experimental film is, is, is sort of goes outside of, of what we would normally expect from a film, which is a narrative, a beginning, a middle, and an end. Right. You know, story of some kind, but but that that uh, expresses something else. Right. Yeah, it's an audio visual experience, and sometimes it's not audio because a lot of people do silent films. For example, Brackage, Meshes of the Afternoon is silent. Um, you know, there's a lot of them. Um, one of the very first films ever made by Georges Millet uh, was The Trip to the Moon. And that's totally experimental. I mean, it was like, what, 1895 or something, I think. And it was, uh, it was a sci-fi film, which I thought was cool. One of the first real films was science fiction. And it's... Um, it's weird. You can watch it on Hulu, I believe, and I think they have a colorized version of it as well. But it's totally silent and weird and experimental. That's that's the one. I guess everybody's everybody's seen it, where there's this 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 uh, this uh, uh, face of the moon, and you get this projectile that sort of comes and and, and pokes it right, right in right the eye. eye. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yes, yeah. I, yeah. I have seen that one. Yes, yes. I got to yeah. ask a question. Okay, sure. come okay. on in. <laughs> so, for all of us that don't do this kind of stuff. When I hear that, like experimental film, right? Does somebody who's making experimental film know they're making an experimental film, or do they think they're making a film and then everybody else in the business is like, "That's an experimental film"? Uh, well, that's a good question. Actually, it, 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 uh, I mean, like, is like, is that a something like somebody goes, to, "I'm going to be an experimental filmmaker," or is it, "I'm going to be a filmmaker" and everybody's like, "Nope, that's an experimental <laughs> film." <laughs> no, that's just called a bad film. <laughs> um, and, and, well, that's another question. Do yeah. we call bad films experimental films to make them feel better, or? Are... Well, there are some really bad films that I think are probably experimental. Uh, <laughs> David Lynch did a couple of early ones. He's kind yeah. of an experimental filmmaker, you know, Eraserhead, yes. and, um, Mulholland Drive, and, mm -hmm. and some of the mm -hmm. others. Yes. You know, he's kind of a borderline filmmaker. He, yeah. he kind of explores. Uh, there's also exploratory film, which is also experimental. There's avant-garde, which is mm -hmm. experimental. But um, he explores some, some things on film that most filmmakers wouldn't, at, yes. especially at that time. Yes, 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 uh, and, and I was also uh, uh, Terrence Malick came up, mm -hmm. and and uh, one of my one of my favorite films to watch is um, uh, the Thin Red Line, right? Uh, that World War Two uh, uh, film that takes place in the Guadalcanal, which which has some you know uh, you you see it first, and it isn't a narrative. Really, you know, there's a, there's all sorts of what some people might consider strange elements to it, uh, almost dreamlike right. uh, elements, you know. And uh, uh, yeah, so so you have those elements, I guess, that are incorporated in what many of us might consider mainstream films. Sure. You know, yeah. And if yeah. you think about it, um, experimental film. What's what used to be experimental? Experimental is now mainstream. Mm -hmm. For example, you know, when movie making first started. People would sit on a tripod and crank a camera, you know, and somebody would do something in front of it, you know, and that uh -huh. was that was a movie, mm -hmm. and they cranked out literally thousands of these things, mm -hmm. and the first camera pan was experimental, the first handheld shots were experimental, I mean, because nobody had had really done that before, and when sound came out, they realized that they could do all sorts of things, you know, foley, that was. That was experimental, you know, making a, a crashing window sound when somebody set their glass down too hard on the table or something. Mm -hmm. So what's experimental today will be mainstream tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Even though it's a little outside the norm, um, experimental filmmakers, to answer part of your question, yes, you do know when you make a film that's going to be experimental. <laughs> At least I did. When I made uh, the one that I gave you guys a, a clip from um, called Landscape, the call is real. Uh, I was down at um, Atlantic Beach, and uh, not Atlantic Beach, Carolina Beach, and I was at the, um, there was a little carnival there, and I was out taking shots of various things, and I thought, well, I'm going to slow some of these down, speed them up, I'm going to get certain shots, because there's a, there's not really a story I want to tell, but I want to put this 
soundtrack to it that's going to be totally opposite of what you're seeing. And somebody at the little carnival, they were talking about a 911 call. So I thought, hey, what a great audio to put behind it. So I went and grabbed a, a real 911 call from the internet and put it as the soundtrack. I compressed it so I would get it down to 10 minutes. It was originally 26 minutes, but it's an actual 911 call of this kid who killed his mother and his sister. Mm. And he's on the phone with this awesome 911 operator. She's the best in the world. She should get some kind of an award for being the best 911 operator. But um, in this little clip, uh, which is kind of, I took the coolest parts out of that. Mm -hmm. You can call it cool. <laughs> but I made a, mm -hmm. like a, a trailer, but it's a short experimental trailer for that film. And I think the trailer might yeah. even be better than the original film. Okay, we're going to play that for you. And again, as you've heard, this is a 911 call of a boy who is confessing to having killed his family. And uh, although it's, you're not going to hear screaming or anything. It's a it's a desperately calm piece, but you do have that warning. That is a subject matter. So with that little bit of a warning, let's go ahead and play that. All right, guys, listen up. Concord County, nine one one. Where is your emergency? I just killed my mom and my sister. I felt like they were suffocating me in a way. What? I just killed my mom and my sister. Don't be sorry. I shot him with a uh, 22 revolver. That's great, all right? This is really going to mess me up for this, you know, in the future. Are you all right? I just killed my mom and my sister. Is there any reason that you were so angry at your mother and your sister? And I've been kind of planning on killing for a while now. Talk to you later. Obviously, you know, I'm pretty, I guess, evil. No, don't be sorry. This is really going to mess me up for this, you know, in the future. You don't want to hurt yourself, do you? Yeah, I'm fine. We're going to help you. We're not going to hurt you, all right? We're not going to hurt you. <laughs> We're there to help you. They, everybody thinks that, you know, we want to do bad things. I just killed my mom and my sister. Okay, um... We in the studio had the slight disadvantage. I've heard this in the past, but we had to sit here in dead silence, <laughs> listening to dead silence. So we didn't hear what y'all heard. Um, tell us a little bit about uh, a little more about that. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, well. And Perry, you're gonna have to look us up when you get home. I mean, we'll we'll play it for you when we're done here. It's, well, that's it's, it's, you you got to hear it. It's yeah. really an interesting piece. Yeah. The um, small clip that you heard, I. Like I said, I made a trailer out of the, the longer piece, and um, it's actually, uh, the longer piece is the entire 911 call, as I said, from mm -hmm. from uh, the 911 operator picking up the call saying Parker County 911. This happened just north of Fort Worth, Texas. And, um, you know, it's a young boy, 17 years old, who had just killed his mother and his sister uh, with a 22 pistol and he's calmly telling her about this. And he says, I think this is really gonna mess me up. I'm a terrible person. And she goes, no, don't, don't be sorry. And she's trying to calm him down and make him feel okay. I mean, but, you know, it's nuts. And yeah. then all the time- but, uh, Obviously, if he's calm, once the police arrive, things will go much better. Yeah, mm. you know, that's true. Plus she, it's, you know, she asked him, do you want to hurt yourself? And he goes, no, um, you know, but, um, the the whole time that this you're hearing this craziness you know somebody confessing to a murder mm -hmm. you're also seeing this you know almost serene view of ferris wheels and uh games at the uh the little carnival you're seeing you know there's a couple of pictures of a restroom mm -hmm. uh there's blank windows there's meters there's people walking down the boardwalk i mean it's just and that's what I was going for is the visual versus the, the audio because people say all the time that we're visual people, but yeah. if sound is messed up, then everything's messed up, right? So, you know, I, I tried to give you that total opposite of what you're seeing and hearing. And it startles you into thinking. <clears throat> it does a bit, um, yeah. When I watched it, 
Mm-hmm. Right. Um, what I kept thinking, I don't know if this was your intent, but in my mind, like I'm listening to a 911 call, but I was creating a backstory myself on how we got to the point of that 911 call. And I kept thinking like, oh, I bet they were at this happy place, like this carnival. Because then like when you're looking at the, like the kind of like the carnival awards, it kind of looks dark, but you can imagine that it didn't at some point. Right. And then it's like, I kept, for some reason, I just kept thinking, I'm like, oh, they went home from the carnival and I don't know, I guess the kid didn't get his cotton candy. Yeah, it's, <laughs> and, I, I guess it's kind of like it, almost any kind of art. It's not going to mean the same thing to every person. Mm-hmm. But it is going to make you think. Right. It's going to reach out. It's going to touch you in some way. I mean, you may not watch this film and come out thinking, gee, I feel much better now. You might come out <laughs> feeling more disturbed about the world or your interpretation of it, and that could be a good thing. Well, the funny story, uh, funny, odd, not ha-ha, but um, <laughs> it was accepted to a film festival uh, called Cinematic Panic over in Memphis. And at the time, we lived in Tulsa, Oklahoma, so we, my oldest son and I drove from Tulsa to Memphis because it was in the festival. And we sat there and watched it, and that's the first time he ever saw it. He didn't. He never saw it on the little screen. He saw it on a big screen with full sound and everything, and it was a little nuts to see it that big because I'd never even seen it that big before. Hmm. And he came out of it going, oh, my gosh. And we talked about it, I bet you, hmm. for the next two days solid. Hmm. And he was like, man, that's really disturbing. I was hmm. like, yeah, it's a little hmm. disturbing. I... It's a little borderline for some people probably, but mm-hmm. um, it kind of gets the point across to me what I had in mind when I made mm-hmm. it was he's 17 years old. should be a kid at a carnival, you know, trying to win a stuffed animal for, for his significant other or for himself even, you know, instead of, you know, shooting his mother and his sister. So. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, we need to segue into your other project here going, but first tell us a little bit. We, I know you I have a couple of more projects that you're getting ready to film, and you're looking for actors. So uh, oh, yeah. tell us very quickly about that and how they can reach you. Okay, sure. Yeah, you can reach me at ken at kenhess.com. That's my email address. And, um, you know, I'll, I'm always on the Internet. My job is writing and, and uh doing things like that so I'm always available so I will answer you right back and um, I am looking for actors and even crew for a couple of projects that I need to get done I have uh, one project called La Vie en Plastique which means life in plastic and it's sort of an experimental series but it has real people it has a real plot it has uh, real characters it also has some not real characters I don't want to give everything away on that one, but just realize that it's uh, it's a little bit different. And I have other projects that I need actors for, and I don't have any, uh, you know, lines drawn as to age, gender, mm-hmm. race, or anything else. Hey, you said among other characters, you're looking for someone who can do physical comedy. Oh, yeah. Now, that uh, that series called Shmata. Um, Shmata. It, Shmata. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. If you understand Yiddish, it means yes. rag. It means a rag, yes. You know, kind of, uh, yeah. uh, and sort of the connotation is worthless, right? But but also people use it for the clothing industry. They say, I'm a, I'm a schmata, you know, I'm in the clothing industry. But this guy is, he is really a schmata. He's like, you know, low class, sort of a Charlie Chaplin, hapless guy. And I need someone who can do some physical comedy for that one. And it will be shot in black and white, probably uh, silent, or at least mostly silent. There may be some foley, but um, you know, it's it's going to be really physical acting. Hmm. So that sounds okay. like fun. Yeah. Now you you had your your first was it the first experimental film festival uh, here here in New Bern? The second one. That was the second one. Right. Okay. Uh, so, what sort of vision do you, do you have going forward? Uh, for this uh, uh, experimental film festival right here in uh, in New Bern, are you, are you trying to make sort of New Bern a, uh, a center for experimental film, or, or that was the original thought? And then I thought I'm going to broaden that a bit, and I'd actually like to make New Bern sort of a a mecca, if you will, for filmmaking in general, huh. and really all of Eastern Carolina. But uh, New Bern, I think, has a lot to offer. You know, it's got the spooky cemeteries with the Spanish moss hanging down. 300-year-old headstones. And to me, that just says horror film. Mm-hmm. I mean, mm-hmm. some of uh, Outlander was filmed there. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, Legend of Sleepy Hollow, you know. And it's like, 
man, as soon as I drove into this town, I thought, oh, wow. I could, I could just be, you know, I could just have a camera hung around me all the time, you know. But, but that's the goal is to get uh, filmmakers to come out here and make films and, you know, hire local people to be extras and crew and craft services and so on. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I'd like to make it a, a kind of a center for filmmaking in general. So you're, are are you planning uh, on a, on a third experimental film festival then uh, next summer or? Oh yeah, it's it's an annual thing. Okay. Um, mm-hmm. And so I'll have it uh, probably. I would think late summer, like I did this year. I had it September 18th at mm-hmm. the Bank of the Arts. And I'm also uh, doing something with, and I know it's vague, but I'm doing something with the North Carolina Film Festival because I'm on the, the board of Inno River Media and they uh, produce the North Carolina Film Festival. So, um, you know, I'm looking at venues right now for that and that will be in the summer. Okay. All right. All right. Okay. And uh, now you were putting together, you were saying, a, a catalog of sorts trying to find people to help uh, market the area oh sure which obviously would be a big thing a big economic boom if we brought in things like that from caterers to hotels uh, but also for locations that kind of thing right uh, tell us a little bit about how you're putting that together what you're looking at sure yeah I'm what I'm trying to do is gather a directory of film friendly businesses that's what I'm calling it um, restaurants uh, hotels, craft services, you know, people who build sets, mm-hmm. people who want to be on crews, actors, and so on. Just just um, really everybody. And locations, people who have homes that they would allow people to come in and film. Wow. You know, whether free or maybe rent it to a, a film crew. Um, that's what I'm trying to do is, is create a directory of those people so that we can distribute that out to filmmakers, not just in North Carolina, but I mean everywhere mm-hmm. so that they will bring their productions here to film and you know make it easy for them rather than going to Cal- um, to Canada to make their films they should come here you know spend it in the states hire local people to do things and you know it's a wonderful place to film because the light quality is so good because there's no pollution you know I go outside and I, every day I think Wow, this is beautiful light. I mean, this is this is incredible. You know? Fresh air, what a concept! Yes. I know, fresh. I mean, the, the trees, the Spanish moss, the water—it's just, it's nuts. And I think people mm-hmm. should know about it and come here to, you know, to basically make films and, and spend mm-hmm. their film budgets. Because if I can make this little plug, what's the one thing you want to do when you see a film? You want to go to where they made it. You know, mm-hmm. if you if you make a film at Captain Raddy's, for example, mm-hmm. and you show you know that upstairs area, the bo- you know the bar area on top, or even downstairs, you know, or some of the other places in town, people are going to want to go there. Mm-hmm. So not only um, do you get the the filmmakers coming here to to spend, but you also, I mean, you're going to have tourists come here mm-hmm. and want to mm-hmm. sit where that happened, mm-hmm. yeah. you know, mm-hmm. and look at those scenes. Well, it's so, like uh, in, what was that town that Bill Murray filmed in? It wasn't Punxsutawney or somewhere in Ohio when they did uh, Groundhog Day. Mm-hmm. And there's an actual sign identifying the exact spot where Bill Murray keeps stepping into that deep puddle. Oh, yeah. <laughs> identifying it. And it's a tourist draw. Where yes, the, so we, were, we were out in the, uh, in the Pacific Northwest uh, this summer. We went to Forks. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, Washington, of course, that's where the uh, Twilight yeah. series, and oh. that's a whole industry here. You, you, you drive yeah. down the street, you've oh. got these, mm-hmm. these cutouts of oh, all, I all the my daughter out in Portland, yeah. and she'd take us out to uh, Hay Rock, I think it's called. Yeah. And it's just a big rock rising out of the water. And uh, to me, that would be worth just going out to see it. But it's like, that's where they filmed the Goonies. Yeah. <laughs> and everybody knows that rock. That's where the Goonies was. Yes. Well, it was so, the yeah, stairs it, in Philadelphia. It, People yeah. run up and do the rocky thing. Mm-hmm. You know? So, yeah, so you, you get an iconic moment and everybody comes, like that baseball yeah, right. field out in the middle of a cornfield. Oh, that's right. Still yeah. draws a huge tourist crowd from yeah. the field of, field of dreams. Yeah. So, um, all right, well, we thank you for coming with us today, yeah. and uh, we'll definitely have you back talking again, I am sure about that. Okay. And we're going to do a little break here and be back at, at you, but uh, we're going to do something completely different. <laughs> and now for something completely different, yes. <laughs> 
Sure, yeah. Am I out? We can take a break whenever you want. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Oh, welcome back. Welcome back. Uh, we're we're back with our next guest here, and we've got an event coming up at the Battlefield Park that is owned by the New Bern Historical Society. Mr. Mark Trail here is a uh, one of the gentlemen who runs that park, if I'm thinking correctly. I'm, I'm one of the tour guides, yes. He is one of the tour guides, and he's going to tell us a little bit about what it is. You may notice that this man is not dressed in common civilian garb. Hmm. He is in that... Uh, well, you're not butter, not you're gray. Yeah. And uh, they had both colors, I guess. Right. Now, yes. North Carolina, actually, as a textile manufacturer going way back, had some of the best-dressed soldiers in that war, if I'm thinking right. That is correct. And the governor was not very friendly about sending his uniforms to Virginia or Alabama or whatnot. Right. So uh, if you saw a good-looking, well-dressed soldier out there fighting, he was probably one of the North Carolina boys. Yeah. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about the park what's coming up here. Well, at the Newburn Battlefield Park coming this weekend, we're going to be doing what's called a living history. Uh, we'll be setting up a full period type camp, uh, showing full soldiers' life, how they, how they lived. Uh, we'll have displays as far as a, there'll be a period surgeon that will be there with all of his uh, normal accoutrements, and he'll be doing a display on how to amputate an arm or a leg mm -hmm. or deal with deal, deal with battlefield conditions. We'll yeah. have a lady there talking about the spies of the Civil War, the lady spies, there were, especially those, there were several around Newburn area. Yeah, Abilene Piggott was the uh, famous one from, uh, from our town. We'll have a weapons display, we'll be mm -hmm. firing displays, we'll do some cooking displays, so we'll be able to show all the, all the, the life and times of what they were in. Uh, now, the surgeon, is he the, is he the same guy, I'm forgetting the name, who actually does surgeries? He'll, he'll take a 
he'll imitate a wound by getting a piece of some kind of raw meat and slapping on your arm, on a volunteer's arm and he'll sew it up and it looks like he's actually doing the job. Yeah. He, it's, it's, it's that his, guy, okay. It's, it's, I don't know if it's the same one you're referring to, but this guy's just, uh -huh. he's, he's very good. He does yeah. the same thing. He makes I, it look as real as possible. Yeah, I used to work at the palace years back, and uh, one night they had surgeon in, and I was one of the wounded that he fixed up. Yeah. And he was looking for an amputee so he could do an amputation, too, mm -hmm. but we didn't find one. <laughs> <laughs> he said some people would actually faint or go away after, after watching that one. Yeah. <clears throat> wow. And that is from when to when? It's uh, Saturday from 8, 8, 8.30 to 5. Uh, okay. The period of time we'll be reflecting is March the 12th, 1862. It's basically okay. two days before the two Battle of Newport took place. Okay. This will be the 7th North Carolina in Garrison preparing for the fight. Now, uh, that battle, of course, was a, a bit of a rough time for Newburn. It, was, it definitely was. <laughs> Slightly outnumbered. <laughs> All right, and we had a lot of, well, both sides had a lot of inexperienced men at that time, but uh, the Union forces had gone down uh, from Norfolk. They'd taken Hatteras, they'd taken all the outer banks yeah. piece by piece. They at least had some experience coming yeah. into, into town when they right. came in the bear fight. Um, give us a nutshell of, of, that, of that battle, what happened. Basically, on March, it actually started uh, on March the 13th with a few little skirmishes up and down the coast there as the uh, Union forces came ashore down in uh, Havelock. Uh, a lot of pillaging, pilfering, them getting their feet, uh, their people fed. Um, he came ashore with somewhere between 10 and 12,000 soldiers. They had just finished the Battle of Roanoke Island. So they were somewhat more trained than the Confederate soldiers. <laughs> his purpose, his orders were to take Newbern and hold it because Newbern at that particular period of time was a deep sea port. You know, mm -hmm. and plus we had to fit the railroad had been finished several years ahead of time. So now we've got our railroads mm -hmm. running south toward Moorhead City, mm -hmm. Carolina City, yeah. and going west to Goldsboro. Washington and so forth. We were also an important cultural and governmental center at the time. Uh, Raleigh was the capital, of course, but people think of New Bern then and they think, well, this little tiny town, who would care? But we were the second largest town in the state at that time. In fact, uh, Atlanta itself only had about 1,200 people compared to our thousand. Exactly. So uh, we were even comparable in size to that city. It was a mm -hmm. very different layout at that time as, as to who we were. Mm -hmm. So it was very critical to the distribution of supplies across the South. And now, when you're, when you're talking about heat, you're talking about General Burnside? General, General Ambrose e. Burnside. Ambrose Burnside, yes. Yep. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, Ambrose would build his reputation taking our town, then he'd go up to Fredericksburg and destroy his reputation for the rest <laughs> yeah, of the war. He, yeah, he pretty much <laughs> yeah, ended it. What was, the, what was the mood of the people at the time? Like, like, how long in advance did they know that the fight was coming? And was there a lot of fleeing, or was everybody, we're going to stay in, you know. General Branch was, received word about three weeks ahead that, that Burnside had taken Roanoke Island, so he knew the battle was ensued within a fa fairly short period of time. The people in the town were told, and, and from what I understand and read, that there was some that left, not a lot, but the, 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 the political parties in, that were running the town said, you can have your fight, but you can't have it in town. So he, that's why he moved the battle to several miles south of town. So like well, the board of aldermen said, sorry, you, sorry, can, sorry, you, you can only can, fight you, outside you, city you limits. Can't, you, can't, <laughs> you can't fight here. There's no rules, but I'm not going to give you a yeah. permit. No. <laughs> no, from, what exactly. I've read, from what I've read and understand of history, uh, it depended on the outcome, what you thought the outcome would be, depended to, largely on were you a resident citizen or were you an officer. Right. Um, uh, I can't remember the 26 North Carolina guy, the guy who got killed at Gettysburg. General Vance. Yes, he he basically said we should abandon the town. He, he thought, it, he said, there's no way you're going to hold this, you get out of here. Right. But yet in New Bern, people were suddenly running, leaving slaves, leaving hot dinner on the table for the Union to come in and enjoy. I don't think they were expecting a loss. They were expecting their boys... Uh, you had some of the early textbooks coming out there saying uh, how many Yankees can one Confederate run off, like a dozen or so and so on. The whole idea of Yankees were so pitiful and right. pathetic that the, 
we can hold off thousands of them, and here comes the reality. No, they're as good as you are. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the people were fleeing on trains in any other way they could to get out of here. Yeah, yeah it, it diminished the uh, capacity of Newer. More than ten, almost half the people got up and left. Mm -hmm. And of course, once the battle started, you the rest of them left. left. <laughs> <laughs> once they realized that line was falling, they were getting out yeah. of here. Yeah, I mean, you got roughly 12,000 against about 4,500, and about five or 600 of those were civilian militia, which lasted about one shot, and they mm -hmm. turned tail and yep. ran. And there was a, there a lot of complexities to that battle. It could have turned out a little better, but uh, it was pretty much a foregone conclusion. Well, but, I mean, you uh, got to understand that win. General Branch was a politician. He, he, was yes. he never went to West Point. He had no military background whatsoever. You know, In fact, he, uh, not long after he became our governor. Yeah. He was our wartime governor. Um, there was only a couple of Confederate officers that even went to West Point. So there was not a lot of tactical experience on the field. And a lot of mistakes were made that day. Okay, now you are in your uniform. Are you with a particular company as a particular yeah, regiment this, you represent? I'm, I'm, I'm dressed with, as Company F, 7th North Carolina. I'm uh, dressed as the Company First Sergeant, which basically is the... I report to the officers, everybody else reports to me. <laughs> You're one of the top kick, as we I, say. I'm the top kick. <laughs> yes. Yeah, there you go. And uh, tell us a little bit about the, the life of a Confederate soldier. And how does it compare to the life of a Union soldier? I'd say, for the most part, they're probably pretty close to the same. Especially early on. Early on, they're pretty well, much well, the same. I mean, uh, North Carolina, like you said earlier, <coughs> uh, outfitted their soldiers very well. North Carolina had, had the material, the manpower, the supplies to provide their soldiers was a, pretty much the best of everything. Mm -hmm. um, they were fed well, in, at least in the beginning. I mean, they got their three meals a day, or they got their, well, not three meals a day, but they got their rations, but it was three days of rations issued every three days. Um, they had a lot of canvas, and, mm -hmm. and so they slept in tents, even though it was four or five to a tent, at least they had something over their head. Well, well, by the mid-war, it was canvas was very scarce, very hard to come by. So now mm -hmm. they're sleeping on the ground. Under and they're the making drinking the coffee rain. made of chicory because they're they're, they're, they're drinking it. getting coffee beans. Well, it's, it's called coffee. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it, 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 as the war moved on, their their rations mm -hmm. dried up. I mean, everything was now being scavenged from wherever they could get it. And mm -hmm. Pretty much, that's 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 where it finally came on in. Is finally we just ran out of beans and bullets and. Yeah. It's not the Fast will. The will, the, too. The, the will to fight was there. Right. They were running out of people. They were running out of supplies. They were running out of food. They were running out of mm -hmm. They were running out of everything. Yeah. And couldn't get it. Just simply worn down by a, and, I mean, a stronger industrial and population they, power. Right, and they and they were just they were just building regiments after regiments after regiments, and the South just didn't have the people to do it. Right, by the end of the war, they were bringing in 12, 13 year olds and 50 okay. year olds and 60 year olds to fight. Any, anybody, oh, yeah. can, anybody that can hold a musket. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Speaking of muskets, tell us about your musket. Now, is that a Char Charlottesville? Or? No, no, Charlottesville would have been Revolutionary War. Oh, okay, I'm thinking we're wrong. <laughs> this is an 1853 Springfield. Uh, it's, okay. a, it's a Ural Arms. It would have been made out of a New Jersey armory. Mm -hmm. uh, you'll know the South they had no way to make these. So, 90% of the arms that the South got were armories that we confiscated early early war. There was a huge armory mm -hmm. down at uh, Fort Fisher. Mm -hmm. That was a Union armory that we confiscated yep. thousands of arms there. Now, in North Carolina, it was a uh, Newburn man who went around getting a lot of our right. arms to begin with, uh, mm -hmm. Colonel Whitford. Right. And uh, he was... Uh, I remember reading, he's, he's got a book that he wrote called The Home Story of a Walking Stick, which he starts out saying, this is the history of the Baptist Church. And he never talks about the Baptist <laughs> Church anymore for some two or three hundred pages. He talks about everything else. Yeah. And uh, you can go down the library and read it. Uh, but he, he's talking about some of the trips he made. He, he talked to Samuel Colt yeah. up in New England, and Colt was more than willing to sell him all kinds of arms to fight his own people. He had right. no problem with it. He wanted the money. Right. And so a, a lot of our early weaponry and everything, we were ready because of that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this this is a fifty-eight caliber mm. muzzle-loading rifle. Mm -hmm. Uses the conical bullet because this one is rifled. So about three hundred yards mm. good. 
which which helped a lot. At least they didn't have to get quite as close. Mm. A typical soldier could fire this weapon three times in 60 seconds. Mm. Now look at today's weapons where you can fire mm. the whole 600 lot rounds in 60 <laughs> seconds. <laughs> yes. Yeah. All right, and um, so your basic weapon show some. We've got some uh, a pile of other things on the floor here. Well, this is the typical gear that a Confederate soldier or Northern soldier would carry. Mm -hmm. um, you have this, this belt with the wonderful three-sided bayonet. Now, by now, the bayonet is not used as often as in previous wars in the actual yeah. fight. It's yeah, you'll find that the bayonet was not used a lot in the Civil War either. Right. In the Revolutionary War, you fired, and then you ran with that thing. And but by ran. now, you run with that thing, you've got um, a lot more killing ground you got to get past before you yeah, can reach the other side. It provides a much more useful tool. It's a nice digging tool. Mm -hmm. Candle mm -hmm. holder. Yes. Stick in the ground. Candles fit yes. right there just fine. You stick a piece of meat stick on it, hold it over the fire. Stick a piece of over the fire. Use it as a pot lifter. Mm -hmm. But it was... Marshmallow roast. It was rarely <laughs> ever put on the weapon and used in an assault. Mm. Uh, you got your cap box, which holds the caps for the musket. Cartridge box, which holds 60 to 80 rounds. Okay, now explain real quick how the rifle is fired in case people are saying, okay, exactly what is a cap, what is a cartridge? Well, okay, let's see. That's a typical cap. Those are, made, those are made just like they were okay, back in the 1860s. Oh, well, anybody can see, see that, that little <laughs> thing there. Are we able to zoom in on that at all? <laughs> That's about as... That's you know, just a, a hollow little piece of a little bit of powder inside. It's, it's got fulminator mercury. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, and there is a, a nipple that it fits onto in the, fire, the, in the firing the pan. And it sends that charge down right. into the gun that right. ignites. And that's a typical this. what we use cartridge. The only <coughs> messing out of that is the actual bullet. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's loaded exactly the same way okay. as we did in the 1860s. We just use it and we make a lot of noise and a lot of smoke. Now, any truth to the fact that you, that you had to have a, a finger to fire with and enough teeth to tear open that cartridge? Well, that's, that's kind of the thing. Is, is I read an article several years ago, and I don't know if it's true or not, but I uh -huh. thought it was kind of neat. Talk about the term 4F. Well, in World War II, if you were 4F, you couldn't serve. Yes. Well, the article kind of mentioned that 4F came from the Civil War. You had to have four front teeth. You can't fire the weapon without teeth. That's right, because you have to. You've, yeah, got, you've got to, to, you've got to be able to rip cartridge. open the cartridge. <laughs> you don't have time to daintily take a pair of scissors and nip it off. No. <laughs> so, now, whether that's a true story or not, I don't know, but it, it, sounded, it sounded pretty interesting, and it's very possible that that's where it came from. Um... Now, about how many shots would a guy carry into a battle? He was probably 60 to 80, normally. Okay. That's about as much as he could carry. I mean, he could probably carry some extra rounds in his mm -hmm. haversack or the mm -hmm. 1860 man purse. Mm -hmm. This carried pretty much anything that he felt was important to him, from uh, comb, some soap, some extra rope, cleaning gear for his musket, medicinal... Whiskey, got to have the good stuff. He'd also bring it, his food would be in here. Uh, coffee, some coffee beans. Uh, and the infamous hardtack. Mm. There's, there's nice. five pieces of hardtack from the 1860s that's still edible. Another reason for those four teeth. It looks delicious. <laughs> yeah, it, it feels like a, a piece of ceramic. I guess it probably chews about the same way. <laughs> kind of like a Pop-Tart. So yes. Well, I don't know about that. <laughs> now, these are those for, things that famously eventually developed the weevils and so forth. Yeah, exactly. And uh, uh, so you had what, a little fresh protein to your right. cracker. What the guys would normally do is they'd break it up into pieces and fry it in, in grease from their bacon or their uh, salt pork or whatever they had, meat that they had, soften it up and fry it and create what's called mm -hmm. a bread patty. Mm -hmm. and, but you had to eat it immediately or it'd be hard mm -hmm. to rock again. Yes. So. Yes. That's fascinating. So. That's fascinating. So how long are you, uh, are you going to... Uh, have this encampment is it just going to be for the uh, two days you well, we'll we'll start setting up friday and we'll have we'll be there all weekend but it's open oh, okay. to the public on saturday okay very good very good and they're going to be uh 
demonstrations and, all day and, long. And talk all, all day long. Yeah. And uh, you're going to be shooting off some of those. Uh, oh, we're going to be shooting the muskets. Exactly. Are there any yeah, cannons no, involved in this? There is no cannon at this particular mm, yeah. event. Well, there is a cannon there to There's see. There's a cannon there, yeah, but, but yeah, there is one. Firing yeah, we, yeah. yeah, you ain't firing that one. It's plastic. Yeah, yeah. Oh, <laughs> no, is it really? I didn't know that. Right. It's cast. No, there, yeah. are, there is an artillery unit or two around. Round. They've they've come down to the palace a couple of times. I think they've been down the oh, battlefield yeah. as well. Oh, yeah, they, yeah, yeah, we've had some. But not this time. Not yeah. this time. Now, I've, I've uh, been to the Battlefield Park uh, on several occasions, and it's really a beautiful place. I mean, it, it isn't mm -hmm. just about history. I mean, it's just a beautiful nature walk, actually. Uh, but uh, the members of the New Bern Historical mm -hmm. Society actually conduct tours, don't they? Walk yes, yeah, I'm actually one of the tour guides there. Okay, well. okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and you actually uh, explained to the people how the battle unfolded. How the battle uh, unfolded, as, as, and, yes. and we've mm -hmm. got markers at each Location throughout yeah, the battlefield, explain what the, happened at each place. The back part of the line, this wasn't where the actual heaviest fighting was in the battle itself. Right, the majority, the, the worst of the fighting took place basically where the fairgrounds are now. And um, going down to the river, going down toward, toward the river, was. toward yeah, mm -hmm. in that direction. Mm -hmm. And I understand there is some slight remains of that original fort still there. Slight. Uh, yeah, it's, I mean, it's, emphasis on a, slight. A, a huge chunk of it's fallen into the river. Right. Mm -hmm. It was uh, basically a sand wall fort, was it not? Pretty much, yeah. Mm -hmm. So the line went across where the uh, fairgrounds are. Mm -hmm. Then at the railroad, it kind of shot it, it back. It shot back about 350 yards, almost a almost a 90-degree turn back up the tracks to, to the battlefield mm -hmm. that's, that's still there. And, and, and then, then from there went out to Bryce, That line went out. To that's Bryce's the line Creek. where the park is. That's where the park is now. Uh, which is not to say there was no fighting there. There are some significant battlefield casualties there. Right. And as I recall, the unit that was defending 20, there North Carolina. almost got caught because they never got the word to retreat that until is after everybody else did. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Basically, so, he looked to his left and realized that there was nobody on his left. And he... And then... Mm -hmm. But finally, he saw the federal troops coming up that side. His only option, he couldn't go backward toward Newburn because if he looked behind him, he saw the bridges were already on fire. Mm. So he had to, had to take his entire regiment across Bryce's Creek to escape that way. Mm. So that was a, a bit of a near miss. Oh, yeah. Has the, has the battle ever been actually reenacted? Oh, yeah. We do, we've done it twice. Uh, we did two full reenactments uh, about, about four or five years ago now. Mm. A couple of farms out, and uh, oh, but it, it didn't actually take place at where. No, the, the it, this this place isn't large enough to, to do a full scale really. Right yeah, they, and they did just, uh, just, the Battle of Bachelors Creek, if I recall. Yeah, right? we did, that yeah. They, yes. they they did one day when the South lost, and then they, they turned and that, around. That's and typical. Did the fight where the South that's a typical won. reenactment when we go to one. No matter where yeah. we are, we tried to do one day the South wins, the other day the North oh. wins. But okay. we'll, we'll mm -hmm. reenact the battle as as the way it was conducted as and best these we can. Reenactors as a rule, a lot of you will have both Yankee and Confederate uniforms yeah. so you can turn and play the other side. Exactly. To, to make uh, the numbers in yeah. other words, if it was forty mm percent -hmm. union and twenty percent, you know, or if you're sixty, whatever it is, is so we try to balance the numbers regardless of no obviously mm -hmm. we're never going to have the numbers that they had there. Right. And there is there is one or two Union reenactment regiments. There are primarily the African regiments that yeah. are reenacting the area as far as the Union side, if I'm thinking right. Yeah, there's the uh, the one out of Triumph Palace. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, a lot of these guys who are really <laughs> deeply into their Southern <coughs> groups, uh, Gene Lilly, I'm sure you know. Yeah, him. oh, yes. I, matter of fact, Gene Lilly's uh, the one who got, got, yeah. got me started. It was that reenactment started. It was that bad reenactment you're talking yeah. about, but I went out there with my camera covering from Sun Journal at the time. Yeah. And he was standing there in a Yankee uniform by a cannon. And I raised the camera up and aimed at him and said, Bill, I love you, but if you take that picture, I will kill you. <laughs> <laughs> he yeah. did not want to be seen yeah, in a Yankee uniform. It was, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So how did the battlefield, give us a, a quick rundown on how we even got this battlefield. Uh, originally, the property belonged to Weyerhaeuser. Uh, mm -hmm. And Weyerhaeuser, as like they do, they try to conduct surveys and everything to make sure that there's nothing of historical content on the field once they realized that the battlefield or there was a battlefield there that there was something of historical significance they immediately turned the property over to the yeah, battlefield trust they, they found a lot of the trenches and everything found the trenches and intact. stuff and so they, mm -hmm. they, they knew that this was part of that battlefield mm -hmm. uh, so they turned the property over to the battlefield trust 
and then at some point, I can then, I don't remember the date, but at some point they sold the property to the New Bern Historical Society, which now owns about 33, roughly 33 acres of land. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah okay. that's a really, really, really beautiful site. Yeah. And I mean, um, I've reenacted on sites all over the East Coast, and this is probably one of the best maintained around. It is, it is beautifully maintained. It's, it's but, but uh, footnote, you gotta watch out for copperheads. Yes, they're, they're, <laughs> well, they, they, the battlefield does go down through a swamp, so yes, yes so you yes, got to watch for the yeah, snakes. They, they had lots of copperheads back in the 1800s, too, exactly. political and otherwise. So, exactly. Um, true. <laughs> and true. Uh, and uh, the park is regularly maintained uh, with, with a lot of help from the Boy Scouts. Boy and, Scouts, and, yeah. And yeah, come down there, a, they build uh, bridges, mm -hmm. they clear out areas for you. We just got approval for an Eagle Scout project that we'll be starting in mm -hmm. the next couple of weeks. Wonderful. Okay, now, oh, yeah. now what are they doing down there right now? Uh, the, the pavilion was added on a couple of years ago, mm -hmm. and they, they, we keep seeing the continual improvements. Are there any, any in the works now? Yeah, we've got a new trail that we, we've started. It's about 50% complete. Uh, it's going to run down to the backside, down, a lot closer into the swamp land, so as you can see okay. a little bit more view of, of how the troops came across. So, okay, and all of these are determined, and there's there's signage up that, that yeah. tells each place you are, so you're not just looking at this trench and wondering what happened here. No, there, there, there's a lot of nice interpretive there's signs a, all throughout the park, plus there's an app that you can now download that, that uh -huh. you can bring with, the, with you, and it'll tell you, mm -hmm. you are here, this is what happened right here where you're standing. Okay. And uh, to, to get there, it's pretty simple. You yes. head down 70, like you're heading down toward the beach, and uh, you get to one of the best-known spots in New Bern, which is Dunkin' Donuts there. <laughs> uh, and that's where you make your tour. Turn right of the Dunkin' Donuts uh, into uh, the, the uh, area there, yep. and then you take the next left. Yep. Across what the railroad, railroad tracks? tracks. And Just cross the tracks and turn left. Turn left. Turn left and go down that little dirt road there, and you'll be surprised how And I said, if you haven't been there, you really need to go down and take a look. Yeah, we, we see, I mean, we see dozens of people every time we go out there mm -hmm. to do work that they're out there with walking their dogs just out there visiting. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's. All right. Well, we're, we're getting toward the top of the hour here. We thank you for your time. Mm -hmm. Well, this has been interesting. Okay. We'll have you back again thank too sometime here. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, don't forget again, those of you who are looking for a role to play, uh, well, the regiments are always looking for new recruits. I know Absolutely. that. Absolutely. Uh, it's, it's about what does it cost all together to, to get uniformed and gunned up here? Well, I don't want to scare people off. It's uh, <laughs> I mean, but if you had to start from scratch and, and buy all of your own gear without any help, you're, you're talking about $2,500. Mm. But the, most of the regiments in the area all have enough spare gear and stuff. I could outfit probably seven or eight people from head to toe with everything they need so, to, to at least come out and try the hobby and see if they like it. Mm -hmm. And then just buy the pieces yeah, as they... Buy piece by piece, piece and get into a little slowly. piece and mm -hmm. get into a slope. Make a really big Christmas list. Yes. Yeah. That's, uh, there you go. <laughs> uh, but we, we do have the tryouts for um, Honor, and yes. that's... Today at three to yes. five and seven yes. to nine. Now, and was yes. the Battlefield Park, speaking of honor, mm -hmm. part of Richard Spate's Claremont property? Probably it was. Yes. Uh, James City is part of his his property. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. Uh, yes, yes. I was. I yes, thought indeed. so. Yes. Quite a, quite a bit. So, so uh, we're going to wrap up here. We're glad you all came mm -hmm. along and yes. uh, for the ride mm -hmm. next week. <clears throat> it will be Thanksgiving Sun Thursday, and I'll well, well, say Thanksgiving mm -hmm. Sunday. Thanksgiving <laughs> Thursday, mm -hmm. which is a holiday, but was pretty much officiated by uh, Lincoln, I believe, mm -hmm. at that time when it became official. And uh, we will have at least one guest, Laura Gammons, the artist. So we'll see you then. <laughs>